Welcome to the Lady Landlords Podcast, where we empower women to gain financial independence through real estate investing. I'm your host, Becky Nova, founder of Lady Landlords. If you're ready to buy, manage, and grow your real estate portfolio, then let's get started. Do you want to give yourself a $1,000 plus raise monthly? Do you want to give yourself a $1,000 a month raise? Well, I definitely do. And that's what I just did in my newest duplex purchase. Hi, I'm Becky Nova, your host of the Lady Landlords podcast. I just closed last week on a, another duplex here in New York. And I wanted to share how I was able to do that so that way you can go out and give yourself a raise too. So as many of you guys know, I do like to invest in New York. I also own property in the Dominican Republic and multifamilies are really the types of properties that I look for. I like those small multifamily properties between two to four units, which keeps it then still considered a residential loan that I would need to be able to do those and residential property. So that's what I've been looking for. Now, I've been looking for this property for quite a bit of time. I was actually trying to buy one back at the end of 2021. And I got to be honest, I was, and I still am, like in love with this property. It was like this 18th century um, farmhouse. It was really, really cool. And it had a, just really nice little details to the house that we just don't see anymore these days. I absolutely loved it. We had the accepted offer and we're moving forward with it. And honestly, we just found things in the inspection report that just came back that were concerning. Things that concern me, one would definitely be structural damage. I have a whole episode here on the podcast that you can hear about the items that you should be looking for from a home inspector and also what things do you really need to kind of consider um, a little bit more. And structural damage is at the top of that list. So that was something, unfortunately, that I decided to walk away from, which killed me to do. I still think about that property all the time, but now I was back out looking for another property. We did take a little bit of time off of looking for some property. Um, I wanted to make sure to diversify my portfolio. I wanted to be able to look and invest in some other things in real estate. So earlier this year, I also invested in a syndication. We actually did a group investment as lady landlords came together and we actually moved forward with the syndication. So I was so excited to get that done. And once we got through that, then I went back out and started looking for properties again. This was now about late spring that I decided that I was going to start looking again. So how do I look for properties? Well, there are tons of ways to do this besides driving around a neighborhood, knocking on doors, sending out mailers, talking to people, networking to people. But one strategy that has always been very successful for me is actually looking for properties simply on the MLS. I have a great relationship with my realtor, Michael Torello. I've actually bought multiple multifamily properties from him in the New York, Connecticut area in the past few years. And it really makes sense to continue to work with people that you know are absolutely fantastic. So what did I do? I called up Michael as I always do and said, hey, here is the criteria of what I am looking for for now my newest property. Now, I have a pretty good idea of what I tend to look for. I tend to have two or three different, what I'm going to call buy boxes of what that criteria is that I look for. What that buy box is, is it's really just saying, here are the conditions that I would like to be able to have met. Once again, I'm looking for a small multifamily with two to four units. This is the neighborhood I'm looking for. This is the price point that I'm looking for. This is the cash flow I'm looking for. Am I willing to accept tenants? Do I want it to be delivered vacant? Am I willing to do a total gut rehab on this? Or am I looking for something a little bit more turnkey? All of those different conditions make it not only easier for me to be able to make decisions on if I'm going to purchase a property or not, but it also makes it much easier for my realtor to be able then to send me curated properties of what I'm actually looking for. I do the same thing when I work with wholesalers or anybody else that might be sending me properties is I make it very, very clear what I'm looking for. The reason I do that is because I do not want to spend all of my day looking at properties. I have a ton of other things that I could be doing with my time rather than just literally sifting through 
property after property after property. I get properties sent to me all day long. I need to make sure that it's very clear what I'm looking for. So in that way, when I can evaluate those, I can simply go and kind of swipe right or swipe left here, right? I can just be like, yep, this works for me. Yep, this works for me. Nope, 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 nope. And then now I just have to go back to those two to really deeper dive and evaluate and analyze those deals. So that's how I started. I made it very, very crystal clear with my realtor, Michael, what I was actually looking for. At that point then, he was able to set me up in the MLS portal where when properties hit the market that I was looking for, they got sent to me automatically. Now, I'm over here buying in New York, but this is pretty much something that's happening anywhere you kind of are in the country right now, is real estate is moving quickly. It has been now throughout pretty much this entire pandemic that we've been living through. So I now, once I was getting those, was automatically knowing what I was looking for. I was able to analyze my deals incredibly quickly, and I knew what properties I wanted to go see. So we went out, we looked at maybe a couple properties here and there that were just automatically sold, um, that automatically just did not have an offer sight unseen that went crazy over ask in like five minutes. So I went to go see some properties. Nothing was really kind of panning out. We were maybe looking for about six or eight weeks by this point in time. So I decided we needed to change things up a little bit. I actually went back, sat down, and I did this on like a late Thursday night. I went back and I looked through all of the listings that I had been sent over those couple months. And that fit my criteria that just for some reason did not work out. And I went through every single listing that I had not seen and that it was still available. I went through all of those again and did a little bit of a deeper dive. Now I'm probably spending no more than 10, 15 minutes on each of these properties looking at them, but there were things that necessarily didn't fit my quick snap decision. But I knew if they were still on the market, there might be something that I was able to do to be able to now adjust and negotiate those terms to be able to make these deals actually work for me. So that was my strategy there. I went back through all of those properties. And when I did, I was actually able to identify two or three different properties that might actually work for me. So I then went, called my realtor on that Thursday night because there were one or two of them that actually had a best and final offer that was really expected either that Friday morning, the next day, or even Saturday morning. So I knew if we were going to do this, we had to be able to move quickly on them. So I then went, called to Michael. We planned out a whole route on how I would be able to see all of these different properties. There are four or five of them that I wanted to see. And how we can plan out to all see them before that best and final and actually be able to still make offers on them. So we did that. My poor husband got a message at like 11 o'clock Thursday night saying, hey, by the way, we're seeing four houses tomorrow morning. Make sure to be ready to leave at like 8 a.m. So luckily I am very fortunate to have a partner that absolutely supports all of my crazy ideas. And he said, okay, baby, perfect. So next morning now, I have my route of the properties that I'm looking at. I know now that these are going to be able to work, or there's just a tiny little adjustment that I have to make to have them work compared to that exact buy box that I'd actually given Michael to start with. So we go out, and the first property was absolutely fantastic. It was a four-family, completely renovated. It was vacant. It was done by a flipper and had just been completed, but move-in ready. I would have had to do nothing besides just screen tenants and sign leases. So we said, okay, this one's going to move fast. So we really need to make sure to get the right number, put that on the side. Went to the next property. Next property, I actually loved. It was a property that I thought I would move into. And if y'all know me, I'm not exactly a country gal. I'm definitely much more of a city woman here. But this place was upstate New York, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. And I got to say, when I got there, I was really disappointed. It was definitely not going to be the right property for me to live into, even though it did have an amazing pool, but there were some ways that I can actually make it work and money would have actually worked for it as well. So that one, we had to move quick on. I saw that property, I think it was at like 10, 10 30 in the morning and we needed to get best and final offers in by like 11 o'clock. So, but we had two other properties I needed to go see. We ended up in a situation, and I just think this shows what really your relationships could be like and should be like with your team. So now we have to get to this other property, but I got to get this offer in. So what we ended up deciding to do was my husband goes ahead 
takes his takes our car and starts driving to the next property. I drive my realtor's car. So that way he can use his hotspot in the passenger seat to be able to get that offer in. Now, another thing you might not know about me is I am actually a horrible driver. It is absolutely my Achilles heel. Never, ever, ever get in a car with me. It is not something I am good at at all. But my realtor actually let me drive his car to the next showing because it was the only way that we would be able to stay on time with the properties that we needed to see and be able to get this property's offer in before that deadline. So we're now driving. He is putting in the offer and we get it in literally at the deadline, the exact minute that it needed to be there before they cut off any other offers. So now we have those two offers in. We go, we see the next property, not done, wasn't doing anything. Fourth property that we go to kind of surprised me. This property, it was very close to the buy box that we were looking for, but it did need a little bit more work than what we were, than what we were looking to do at that point in time. With the other things we had going in our life, we were definitely looking for something a little bit more turnkey this round, rather than doing something that needed some renovations or a lot of upgrades. I was really looking for something that was going to be, um, that was going to be turnkey. And also I was actually looking to inherit tenants at this point in time. This property was definitely under the budget that we were looking for. Our buy box was that we were looking for multifamilies with two to four units for under $500,000. I also was looking for a minimum of $500 per door, but that's where I got stuck. A lot of properties here in New York are either not meeting that 1% rule or they were in a position where they just, and the reason for that was that some of these places just had really low rents. A lot of people were not either raising rents during COVID or were a little concerned when they added leases during that time and things were just not as structured as we had been pre-pandemic. So this property came up again on my list because it was a little outdated, but not any work that kind of scares me. But then also it had these lower rents and I was like, well, if I could get this property for the right price and change those rents to the right price, this might work out. We go see it. And honestly, I got to say, and I hate saying this, but the house is ugly. The house is absolutely ugly. It was by far the least attractive house on the block. It's a weird shape. I did not like the outside of it, but who cares about how the house looks? I care about the numbers because that's how I run my business. So we go inside, we meet the first tenants on the first floor. They have been there for 29 years, 29 years. You could tell though that the landlord probably hadn't done any upgrades in those 29 years either. So we looked at it, but they were there. They were happy. They wanted to stay. And when we were talking to them about it, there were a lot of things that they were just kind of like, oh yeah, the kitchen's outdated. We don't cook anyways. Haven't even been in that room in 15 years. We were like, oh, interesting. Um, they were a very sweet couple. They were also very concerned about if they were going to be either displaced with a new landlord buying the property or what was going to happen to their rent. These, this was an elderly couple that's really on a stabilized income and that concerned them. But they were paying very, very little money for that three fam, for that three bedroom unit that they had here in New York. It still was something, but it was not great. So we did make sure to kind of say to them, hey, by the way, if we end up moving forward with this property and buying it, we would actually keep you as tenants. We'll talk about what rent would look like. We'll rediscuss terms of lease because at that point they actually were not on the lease. So I did explain to them that that is something that we required as landlords and they were okay with it. And they felt much more comfortable. They actually, I think, wanted us to be able to buy the property. I still wasn't so sold. The next thing that happened was the second unit upstairs. When I looked at it, rents, once again, were decent on the second unit, but a little bit under where I was looking for. Not too bad, but a little bit under what I was looking for. Felt that there was definitely some room for negotiation or with some rent increases over the next few years, I would get to the place where I really needed. Not a bad opportunity. But when we went to go look at the second unit, we saw the tenant on her way out. She actually decided to give notice and was moving out. She was a little concerned about what would happen with the new landlord, felt she was going to be kicked out anyways, because a lot of people were purchasing owner-occupied properties that had come through. And there was a deal that had fallen through on this property, a contract that had fallen through 
where it was actually going to have to be owner occupied. So the tenant said, well, I'm going to get kicked out. I'm going to leave. Part of me said, I really wanted to buy something that I did not have to put tenants in. I really wanted to inherit tenants, but this does give me that opportunity to be able to raise those rents. So when I originally had looked at this property, it fell under the numbers that I was looking for. With this property, it was listed at 335,000 for the duplex. So like I said, it was under the budget of what I was looking for. I was gonna be putting down 25% because it's an investment property. So 25% is incredibly standard right now, especially um, since the pandemic had begun, really you're not seeing a, a lot of opportunities to put that 15 or 20% down that you used to be able to. It's really 25 for a property that's not gonna be owner occupied. So I knew I was putting my 25% down and with the rough estimate of interest rates at that point in time, looking around a six and a half, that was really gonna put me all in for my mortgage with my taxes, homeowners insurance, all those types of things. I was probably gonna be looking around $2,200 a month for and what was gonna cost me just for that mortgage insurance taxes, right? Well, the rents, the way that they were, if I'd inherited those two tenants, would put me a little bit around, um, I think it was about three grand. So that really put me in about $400 a door. Not bad at all, but I really wanted my $500 a door. I was willing to go look at it and consider it because that $400 is really not far off what I was looking for. And if once again, I could adjust some of the terms of the sale, it would actually meet my numbers. So when I saw that that first tenant had moved out, like I said, was it something that I was looking for? Not necessarily, but did I realize that it was something that I could work with? Absolutely. Now here's the kicker on this property. That upstairs unit, it was in decent shape, but definitely you need some cosmetic updates. This was something that I was a little bit more willing to do normally, but this time I really wasn't looking to do any type of work on this. My husband is actually usually the one that always prefers the turnkey, nice updated, buttoned up properties. This one though, it was an older building and had definitely been neglected by the previous landlord and probably the, the landlord before the previous landlord. They hadn't really done anything here. I was really not too excited about this property, but my husband actually was okay with it. I was surprised by that. So what we decided to do on this property was just throw in an offer and see what happens. We ended up putting in an offer for about $20,000 less than what the property was. Once again, the property was listed at 335. We went in at 315 on it. I didn't think they would actually accept the 315, but I was able to learn a couple of things from talking and meeting with those tenants. The tenants had, had known that a contract had fallen through, which was why now they had to open their home to have strangers coming in and looking at the property again. And they also knew that their landlord was really upset about it. The reason they knew their landlord was upset about it was because he was actually reassigned from his company to a post that was based in the UK. And he had to leave and he had to leave like ASAP. But now he had this property and he really was not in the business of actually being able to manage this. And he wanted nothing to do with the property as he was being sent to, to Europe at that point in time. So I also knew now that I had a distressed seller that really needed to kind of offload this. So we said, you know what? Let's just throw this offer in. So now after just going through that MLS and re-looking at all those properties that at first glance I'd kind of passed on, I was able to identify those four properties that might have actually worked for us. Out of those four, I ended up putting in three offers on that very Friday. So interestingly enough, I actually had two out of those three offers accepted. The first one that I mentioned that was the turnkey four unit, oh my God, whoever paid for that paid way too much money. I didn't get that one, not a problem for me, not upset about it because the numbers just didn't work at whatever number then this person paid for it. I'm not chasing that. The second property that I absolutely loved, but yet wasn't right for me to personally move into, I got that accepted offer, but 24 hours later, the seller decided to take it off the market and decided not to sell it. So nothing I could do there, no loss on me. Then this third property, the one that I actually liked the least, ended up coming back and they negotiated with us. 
we were able to settle on a price. We came to that 225, which was really just kind of splitting things down the middle and coming up with that number. Now, this was actually great for me because by lowering that price, I was able to then make a little bit extra on the number that I needed in my cash flow to get closer to my $500 a door. So that brought me up a little bit. I now definitely feel much more excited that if I could raise rent a little bit on the couple that had been there and was planning on staying, and then also could do those couple just simple cosmetic upgrades of painting and putting down new carpet or putting down an LVP floor, I knew that I was going to get a lot more money for that property up top. And that was what was going to make this deal work for me. So we went through with it. We ended up being able to get that property for then three twenty-five. dollars but a couple items came back from the inspection. There were definitely some safety issues. One of the entire units that that couple was living in for 30 years had absolutely no smoke or carbon monoxide detectors, not a one. So there were safety things that definitely need to be handled. And then there were also a couple other projects that were would have just either been a safety problem or would just be something that then I would have to fix. For example, the stairwell up to that second unit, there was a landing. And the landing was incredibly slanted, definitely dangerous, definitely something that needed to be fixed in general. So we put all those things in the inspection and we were actually able to negotiate to have all of those safety things like smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors fixed for us before we closed on the property. So that way we knew that our tenants were living in a safe home, but then we were actually able to get them a seller's credit back at closing for an extra $5,000, which then really lowered our price to let's say that 320, kind of just make numbers a little bit more even. So now I'm buying a property in New York at the height of the market with crazy prices, crazy properties. I now got this property for under asking. Already fantastic. That makes my numbers and analysis much better and already moving me that needle much closer to that $500 per door. Then we went through we now bought that property. Like I said, we closed last Friday. But now we have to deal with the fact that I have an empty unit that has some cosmetic upgrades that needs to be done. That's fine and simple. We can actually get that. I'm already a week into it and I'm gonna have this place rented by the 15th of the month. I know it. I already have a list of names of people that are interested in renting a property in this area with those two bedrooms and for the price that I'm looking for. Also, what's gonna be able to happen is I'm going to have a, I was able to talk to the tenants. Now you might've seen my video last week about the binder method. The binder method is a process by Dion McNeely who talks about how to increase rents when you inherit tenants. Now, Dion and I actually built a very similar portfolio. We like to inherit tenants. We like to be able to find some properties on the MLS and make those deals kind of work for us. So. I made sure to interview Dion here for the Lady Landlords podcast because this was just such a great strategy that I know has helped so many of our members. So if you've not heard Dion's strategy, make sure to go back and listen to last week's episode. But we were able to then go and simply talk to that couple on that first unit. We went in and a brief synopsis here of the binder method is the idea of showing your current tenants really what the comps are in that area, what it would look like if they needed to move and they needed to pay a first month's rent, the security deposit, um, last month's rent, all of those different things, but also now they're gonna have to pay market rent. And you show them kind of what that looks like and what those properties available are. Then we really have an open discussion about what they feel is an appropriate rent. By including them in this decision, they have a lot more value from it and they're a lot more willing to kind of meet you in the middle here. So according to Dion, statistically, his, when he's used the binder method, he gets between a 20 to a 28% increase in rent. When I was able to have this conversation with our tenants, we actually had a 37% increase in rent. They increased their rent by, they chose to increase their rent by $400 a month. That was something that really moved that needle over what I was looking for to get that $500 a door. Now I have tenants that are paying still under market rent and a very reasonable rate for this couple that has been there for just so many years. So we were happy to do that to make sure that they weren't displaced and keep them there. We also talked about what rent increases were gonna look like moving forward so that they know how to, what to expect 
and to be prepared for those things now. They actually left that conversation incredibly happy and actually thanking us for allowing them to stay in the home and to be able to pay a number that they could afford being on a stabilized income. So all parties just felt really great about the way that we were able to come to a consensus there. So now I have a reasonable rate, still under market rate, but a reasonable rate for that first unit. And now I have the opportunity to make just simple cosmetic updates that'll cost me maybe $3,000 and a little bit of elbow grease to be able to get top dollar for the other unit. That now is going to be able to raise my cash flow to between a $1,300 and $1,500, depending on the rent I get, the $1,300 to a $1,500 um, increase in cash flow monthly that actually exceeds the $500 that I originally set out to buy. And I was able to do that in the state of New York in a high competitive area and with the high sale prices that you see and also these interest rates that keep sneaking up. So ladies, my words of advice to you is that there are still deals out there. We need to go, we need to not only be looking for deals and what fits our buy box and the criteria we are looking to buy, but when a deal does not work, take a look at it, spend an extra couple minutes and say, hey, is there a way I can make this deal work? What needs to happen to turn this stud into a deal? Thank you very much for joining me for this episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. Please do make sure to subscribe, whether you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, to not miss next week's episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. We re release new episodes every single Tuesday, so make sure not to miss out and give us a like and leave us a review if you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much and see you next week for the Lady Landlords podcast. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you're feeling stuck in your real estate journey, visit lady-landlords.com slash roadmap to book a one-on-one -on -one workshop with me. I'll help you determine your next best strategy. Or you could subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive tips and offers. Invest with confidence, become a lady landlord today.